changed. So, if I try and move this forward, let's get kicked off. Real. Okay. Um, so first of all, we're going to have a look at um, what is what is mastery, um, and then we're going to look at a few things before we do our ozone five tour. We're going to look at a couple of concepts um, that are definitely worth exploring before we sort of kind of start talking about mastery. Um, then we're going to have a quick uh, kind of whistle stop tour of uh, some of the cool features in uh, ozone five, uh, and then if we get some time, we'll um, do questions. Uh, but again, keep it quite whistle stop so we can get a bit of time for collaborating and whatnot at the end, and uh, do a bit of do a bit of networking as well. Cool. So. Crack on. Uh, Brill. Uh, so, actually, before we start talking about this, so, so, so what is mastery then? Um, anybody want to have a go at kind of summing it up in, a, in one sentence or two? Okay. Well, I guess the way, I, guess the way I, I think about mastering is it's, you know, you're going to do it right at the end um, of, your, of, your, of your production kind of cycle. Um, what you're essentially doing, I suppose, is you're adding a chain of um, effects or uh, plugins, or you know, whatever, to um, to your master track uh, to kind of f fill out your sound. Um, you might be, depending on what kind of music you're doing, you might be kind of com compressing it, limiting it. But you're doing it, you're applying it to the whole track to kind of glue it together um, and really give it kind of a um, synced up kind of sound, so that everything sort of sounds in um, in place and things like that. Um, so there's nothing kind of too quiet, too loud, etc. And um, so. A couple of concepts, and the first one that I just wanted to explore is um, spectrum analysis. And this is really, really useful um, when you're mastering. So, this is actually a picture of one of the um, Ozone 5 um, uh, spectrum analyzers. Um, and when you're, what you really want to do is be able to kind of, um, so you've all seen an EQ, how that works, and, you, and it reacts quite quickly, and you can see kind of the, um, the whole spectrum uh, moving along with the track kind of thing. But when you're mastering, you really want to create sort of, you want a tool that's going to create like an average of that. So kind of what is, what does the shape of the track look like through the whole spectrum from right from the start to right at the end. Um, and what you're looking at here um, is a spectrum analysis of a, of, of a particular track and it's this kind of top line here. Um, and one of the things that I've probably picked up recently um, is you probably want this to look quite similar um, depending on the the, the genre of, of, of kind of music that you're creating, and depending on the um, of what what kind of style it's, it's done in, what instruments it's kind of done with. So, in terms of spectrum analysis, this would probably be something um, kind of a pop song. It's going to look something like this. Um, so there's a kind of quite a bit of mid range here. So there's, uh, I imagine there's probably vocals, um, and then it kind of kind of tails off at the end. Right up here, you can you can kind of hear this um, a lot easier than you can hear this sort of stuff. So it doesn't tend to be as high, kind of thing. Um, so for a uh, like a dance track or something like that, you're going to have that kind of punching sort of kick drum. So what you might expect to see is something kind of up here, quite high, and then it kind of tails off down the end. If you did like a classical one, and you did a spectrum analysis of a classical tune with like um, violins and pianos and all sorts, um, probably quite even across across the spectrum. To be honest, there'd be lots of kind of dynamic range. So it'd be very very kind of high because you don't tend to overly sort of compress. Uh, you know, like a classical um, sort of track viewer coming up with that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's just an example of, of, of spectrum analysis and kind of what, what it is. Um, has anyone ever heard the term uh, loudness, loudness wars? Anyone heard that? Do you want to have a pop? Um, it's kind of the idea that people use limiters to, to drive as much volume out of their sound without distorting them in the idea that it sounds better but some people think you lose dynamic content from Exactly, so it's that kind of ongoing argument like how um, how, how far can you go with your, how, how much can you squash a track and, and, and limit it and compress it and um, excite it and things like that before it starts just to sound um, you know a bit flat or you know d d d can it be overdone? And you can see here, sort of over over the years, um, on an average, uh, there's some examples of, of waveforms attracted here, and they've got louder and louder um, as we started to kind of process and compress. Obviously, our music um, taste has changed. So, popular music in 1983 um, would have been a lot different to uh, what it was in in 2000. Everything seems to have gone a bit more electronic and a bit more kind of dancey um, in, in in popular music now. So, so yeah. Uh, it is, you know, the, the, the ongoing sort of 
debate, I suppose, about how, how much can we really sort of squash a track. Um, there's a the concept of compression here, and obviously when you, when you apply uh, compression to a track, essentially you're, um, you've got quite a lot of kind of dynamic range within this, uh, within this uh, example here. And once you've compressed it, you're kind of bringing the, the, those, those peaks and troughs kind of closer together in the waveform, and you're, you're kind of pushing the... Um, uh, you're kind of squashing the, 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 the waveform down when you're compressing it. And even in this example, you can see we've even cut off some of those resonant peaks there as well. Um, yeah, good. Uh, so the, only, the other thing um, to understand is uh, RMS. Anyone know what RMS stands for? Root mean square. Root mean square, very good. Mathematical um, term. Uh, it, yeah, it is a mathematical formula for what is essentially... Um, what is the perceived loudness of this of a, of a particular track? Um, how, how loud does it sound to us? So, if you've got a um, a kind of way of monitoring not just the actual volume of a track but also the RMS volume, then that can be really powerful for mastering. This is an example from Ozone here, and it's got this great kind of um, volume meter uh, where you've got your so left and right is before and after. So before you've added all the effects within ozone um, and after uh, and also it's got this kind of these top and bottom sort of values and what you're looking at here is so we can see this one is as you might expect has been kind of mastered to zero db um, but the actual perceived loudness or, or on the snapshot that I, that I took for this particular example uh, was minus 6.2 db um, and I guess it's probably widely accepted again it very much depends you know what what music are you producing? Because you're not going to want a classical track to have, you know, <coughs> any kind of dynamic range like this. Um, but if you're doing something like um, a bit more uh, contemporary, for example, pop or dance or something like that, um, generally between four and six uh, dB is pretty common uh, these days uh, in terms of in terms of uh, RMS level, I suppose, on a track. So 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 ozone really helps you, I suppose, to kind of monitor that, um, and that's kind of what what RMS is. Um, the next thing um, I wanted to do is we're not going to kind of talk too much about mix down um, because mastering is, is kind of a massive subject in, in and of itself. Um, but there are a few mix down tips um, that are definitely worth kind of adhering to um, if you want to have a good master. Um, the first one is three, three to six decibels of headroom. Um, what that means is uh, if you're, let's say this is your master kind of thing, you want your, your master or your pre-master um, to come to somewhere between three and six. Three is a push, definitely, um, especially if you're going to compress it and limit it quite a lot. Um, but you want, you want to be peaking um, at around, say, six dB, so you've got another, uh, sorry, minus six dB, so that um, you've got kind of six dB worth of headroom there, because when you master it, you're going to kind of squash and compress and limit the whole track and as such, it's going to get louder, I think, uh, and that will kind of fill those, fill those gaps. Uh, the next one is um, bounce to audio, um, and this is really interesting because there's a couple of reasons why you might want to bounce a track to audio before you master it. Um, I do, and I do it in another project, to be honest, and one of the reasons is CPU, um, because you know, it would be a lot, lot lighter on CPU. If you're playing instruments and you're trying to use kind of mastering programs at the same time, um, you've got to have a really powerful uh, uh, PC behind you um, to be able to do it. But also because audio is just so much nicer to work with when you're mastering, you can see the waveforms, you can kind of see what they're doing. Whereas with a MIDI instrument, um, you know, you can see the MIDI notes that you've played in, but that's not really what you're kind of focusing on in the mastering stage. Um, so definitely, yeah, export, export to audio. Um, what I do is I solo uh, each of the uh, tracks within my project, and then I'll record them out um, to uh, a 32-bit WAV, um, and I'll place that into another project, and then start mastering from there. Um, and we'll have a look in a, in a minute at that. Um, but again, you know, it's just one way, one way of doing it. Um, let's skip to let's skip to normalise because this is really um, this is really important, and it kind of kind of goes with bounce bounce to audio. Um, don't normalise your Track. So if you are going to export to audio your tracks separately, um, if you normalise them, then essentially what you're doing is you're making them, you're, Ableton will go through the whole track, find the highest point, and it will make that 0 dB. So it will peak. 
So then you're not going to have your kind of three to six dBs of headroom. What you're going to end up with is eight to ten or maybe five or six tracks, all at peaks at zero dB. Um, and then you'll have to kind of bring them down in the mix now stage, and, and you can kind of lose a bit of quality doing that. Um, although that's arguable, but it's not massively noticeable, especially if you're making something quite hard and punchy anyway. Um, high pass everything. That might be a bit. That might sound a bit controversial. Um, I high pass everything at around 30, between 30 and 40, depending on what kind of music you're making. Um, high pass everything at around um, uh, 30 hertz because. You, your ears can't hear anything under un, under 30 hertz. Um, but also, if there is any content in your track that is under 30 hertz, it can, um, especially on uh, slightly cheaper kind of subwoofers and things like that, it can kind of muddy up the sound a little bit if there is any content under there. So you can't necessarily hear it, um, but supposedly um, it does. It can muddy up the sound. So high pass everything because under under 30 hertz, you really you really can't can't hear much of any concept. So don't dither um, if you're kind of mass, if you're exporting to audio. I don't dither anyway. And there's so many different kind of arguments about what kind of what did that is. I mean, you don't dither, do you, Mark? No, uh, I don't dither. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, don't dither. Tell us. <laughs> eventually, oh, maybe. <laughs> eventually. Uh, yeah. Very last. Very last thing. If I'm doing okay. very last thing. Yeah. So um, I've watched a few uh, videos on YouTube from really, really kind of good producers, and um, some of them sort of say, <laughs> "Oh, you should only dither if you're going to, if you're going to master it out to kind of vinyl. Um, you, you, different types of dither to use, things like that." I think basically what what dither is is when you, whenever you reduce the quality of a track. So if you're kind of starting with 32 bit, and you're you're going to eventually get to 16 bit because that's kind of your sort of CD quality that you want that you want your track to be in. When you kind of reduce the bit depth, um, it will generate uh, random, uh, well, repetitive rather, errors in the audio. Um, you can't really hear kind of exactly what they are, but but apparently, um, random errors is nicer to the ear scientifically than um, the repetitive errors. So essentially, what it the other does is kind of add a little bit of very low level noise to the to the track that's virtually inaudible. Um, that makes those errors kind of more random and, and, and then you kind of you, you, you hear them uh, a lot nicer and apparently it's nicer to the ears overall subconsciously but, um, but obviously for mix down we don't want to we don't want to do there anything okay so don't use that cool so um, yeah let's have, a, let's have a quick let's have a quick tour of ozone 5 uh, and what switch to Live. Excellent. I'll just close this for a second. So, are we hooked up to audio? Um, so we've got a. Yeah? Yep. So we've got an exported track uh, here. So this has been um, mixed, mixed down. Um, again, you know, I'm a bit of a bedroom producer, so it's only a bit of a hobby, but. Um, so this is just something I've come up with. What you'll probably notice about this track is um, there's not a there's not a massive amount of kind of mid range. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, first of all, it might make it a bit easier for us to hear what kind of ozone is doing. Um, but also, I have left a bit of room for a vocal because at some point um, it might be nice to get a uh, to get a vocal in there as well. So there is a bit of uh, a bit of mid range missing. But let, let, let's kind of play it and see what we're see what we're working with. Let's see if that's working.
very <coughs> stuff in there. There's not, there's not, there's not a massive amount going on kind of thing. It's like, it's a kind of, um, it's a glitch hop track, so it's kind of especially like a bit funky. Um, it's got some kind of things like quite heavy on the bass, things like that. Um, so let's have a look at what we did in Ozone Five um, to kind of bring those bring those sounds together. Right. So firstly, let's go let's go through um, some of these features. If I stand over here, that might be a bit better because I won't be blocking the view. Okay. Um, so the first thing I start with um, is, is, is this down here. So you've got your effects, um, all the effects that you may kind of apply. Um, and the ones that we're going to go through today, um, probably the ones that I use, you might notice that our, the, the track is compressed already. I really like Ableton's glue compressor. Um, so in, in terms of glue, it's going to compression. We started with a kind of standard uh, glue, glue compressor. Um, there's loads of really good um, presets that come with that. So to start with them, then maybe kind of tweak it a little bit. Um, when, when you're mastering uh, for, for compression. There is a really good compressor on here as well, um, and we might have a quick look at that if we get time, but I start with stereo imaging. Um, so essentially what, what stereo imaging is, is as you kind of play the track, and if I just bring this right down so we can see it but not hear it too much. Um, yeah, let's go to the view of the car. Plate. Okay, so the stereo imager, and you can kind of you can kind of control each of these plugins. There's a uh, three, six, seven uh, plugins um, or, or effects. You can you can turn these on and off, and you can kind of switch to each one. And, and depending on which one you switch to, it will change this this kind of user interface. Your volume uh, metering will stay the same. So this is the one we saw earlier um, in the in the PowerPoint. Um, now, stereo imaging is essentially it's looking at the whole track um, and and the kind of how how is it spread across the stereo spectrum kind of thing. And one of the coolest things you can do with Ozo Five is you can you can solo one of them. So you can hear that I've soloed the bass there. So you're literally you're just listening to this this very low end, and you can move these. Um, as you want, so you can kind of. Now we've got that soloed. Yeah, shift it up and down, and then we can start to make changes. Let's put it back down there. We can start to make changes to the um, to each element separately. So we saw that the bass was essentially mono there. So typically, with, with this sort of music, you want your bass to be in mono. So essentially, we've selected the bass sort of section. Um, you can select the mid range there, you can select the high range, like that, separately. And then based on these colours these colours down here, you can kind of mass them out. So you can see that the bass has been dropped all the way down to zero, so it's, it's mono essentially. It's, it, it's, there's, there's no stereo spread whatsoever, it's, you can hear all of it dead, dead, dead centre. Um, that's kind of typically what you want with this sort of music. Um, again, not for everything, but and what we've done as well is you can kind of add, you can spread whole track separately as well. So this high end that we can hear here, yeah. um, we've spread that just a little bit, we've just given it a touch, just touched it up ever so slightly, so it's that 3.2%, 32.8% percent even on the screen. Um, and you can see how the, now that we're just looking at this, this, this higher end, um, it's kind of, you can see how it's spread out. And what you kind of don't want is, is to go too far, kind of pan too far to the left or right, um, too often kind of things. You spend a lot of time over here, you're going to hear a lot of stuff in the left, um, not a lot going on in the right. Uh, you spend a lot of, um, of time over here, then you know, vice versa. Um, so what you can do is you can individually, um, for each kind of section, you can set how you know the width of these sections, and you can kind of chop little bits of it up, um, and up to four. Um, you can solo them and, uh, and list those separately, and you can kind of add some content in there as well by kind of by spreading it further across the spectrum. Um, so for this track, we've just touched it up, made sure everything's in mono first of all, and then we just added a little bit into uh, to the fourth band there. So that's the first thing that I would I would do. Um, okay. uh, another brilliant feature is the harmonic exciter. Um, 
And all of these plugins run on pretty much the same principle. You can you can kind of select uh, a, a, a range um, and you can apply effects to just that range. Now the harmonic exciter will essentially fatten out your kind of sound a little bit. So you can see if I select this uh, range here. If I start to bring this up, start with nothing. So this is the bit we're listening to. If I bring this up, you can hear it kind of adding in more, more, more content. Obviously, after a certain point, it's gonna, it's gonna really reduce the quality of the sound. Um, so you never want to use that too much. Just a real, just a real kind of touch. But again, you know, you can, you can split it out for four different sections you've got there of the, of the spectrum, and you can kind of, you can move them around and apply it to different areas, which is. Which is really powerful. Um, different types. Um, so you've got a mode here. I don't know, if, don't know how clear that is from, from back there, but you've got warm, retro, tape, tube, triode, and dual triode. Um, essentially, it's kind of uh, this is the softer kind of harmonic excitement, um, and this is the and it gets harder as you kind of as you go down. It'll be more aggressive. Cool. So equalizer uh, is next. So with the equaliser, this is um, a really powerful EQ, um, and what you can do is you might not just EQ the whole spectrum as one. What you might do is something called mid-side mid -side compression. If you notice, I just click down here and you can change it from stereo compression, which is essentially the, the, the whole of the stereo spectrum, to mid-side compression. And what you're doing with mid-side compression is you can sorry, compression, uh, mid-side equalization, rather, um, you can EQ the, the center of the stereo, of, of, of what you kind of hit here, but then you can also EQ the far left and right separately. And that can be quite powerful, because you kind of want, you don't want as much, we know we don't want too much bassy kind of sounds in the, in the, in the far in the kind of stereo spectrum, but we do want um, some of the higher stuff to be out there. So you can separately select the side, and you can apply kind of a, a boost uh, to, to the side, and you can go back to the mid, and you can do that separately. So you can kind of drop, you can drop the bass on the sides, like that, a little bit, so just a touch. And then you can boost it in, in the kind of, in the mid range, which is a really powerful tool. Um, okay, what else have we got on there? Yeah, so mid-side, left-right compression, I haven't explored that much to be honest, but I think you know, you're know you going to separately apply EQ into the left and then to the right uh, sides of the stereo spectrum. Uh, and then the values underneath are essentially kind of, I mean, you know, if you click on, if you click on a particular uh, point, then it will kind of tell you what, what exactly what, how many hertz is that and how much of a boost or a, or a cut you're actually making. And then... Uh, the maximizer is the is, is the final one I want to go through. So you can see I'm using you can switch them on and off as you kind of go through. Um, this particular one is the maximizer, and this is what you kind of do last. They go in the order that they are um, on here. I think it goes like that. So so maximizer will always will always come last. Um, if you think you've got um, something might be causing a problem in the mix, something like that, you can switch it off, switch it back on, just like that. Very easy. Come over here, turn this one off, turn it back on. So that will make changes to the sound. Now the maximizer is where you're going to do your final kind of um, your you kind of you're going to get it to you're going to normalize it. Kind of, you're going to get to zero dB. Um, so again, um, there's modes that you can use here, and again, the, the further down you go, the harder it gets. Kind of thing, the, the more kind of it's going to squash the sound. Kind of thing. Um, some people say you should always master to uh, minus 0 0.1 dB, but um, Ozone actually has a feature called intersample detection, and if you turn this on, um, you don't have to do it because it will detect those peaks, and it won't, and it won't, it will stop the track clipping um, just by having this on. So you can mask them to zero, to zero dB in, in in Ozone. So those are probably the top features. Some of the stuff I haven't talked about. Um, there is reverb. I mean, I've never applied reverb to um, a whole track before, so I haven't played too much of this. But it, but again, the principles are by and large the same. Um, the screen you can see is the same, um, you've got your EQ at the top here, um, you can have a play of the settings uh, with that. Um, dynamics is where you would do your compression, and it is pretty cool, again I, I really like the glue compression in Ableton for just pulling a whole track together. Um, 
with with a compressor, what we'll do is we'll just have a quick go because I don't know too much about this one. Um, again, you know, you select sections of the track and change, change it. You tend to want these to be in the same place throughout all the effects. Um, but what you can do is um, you can apply compression to only certain areas of the track. So if you think something needs kind of boosting, things like that, and um, or it needs a little bit more compression, you can apply it just in, in within a certain range, um, and you can do that for up to four ranges. Again, you can you, know, you can solo those areas to see what effect it's having on your track as well. So that's pretty cool. And yeah. So the last thing, probably just to um, to quickly mention, is um, the more expensive version, which I don't have, of um, Ozone 5 has got this this meter bridge. And this really is your, you know, your, a really powerful <coughs> analysis tool. Um, I don't know if it'll, how the CPU will handle this, if it is max, which should be fine. Uh, but let's say if we just selected this uh, spectrum here, we, you can see how we could get some really funky um, effects. We can start to kind of analyse the track. Um, and you can really start to see where your kind of resident peaks are the whole track. I mean, that, that, that's sick, but I, I, I'm pretty confident that wouldn't work. I might, I might have to it would just die if I tried to run that. Um, but yeah, so there's tons and tons of analysis tools in the, in, in the more expensive version, but it is, it is it's like, um, was it like 500 euros or something like that? So Yeah, just um, for the inside thing. And that's the basic one? Oh, no, no, for, you can buy it, that's instant you can buy inside. inside. And that's this stuff on its own? Yeah, but you can get it. Wow. So you can buy it on its own, but yeah. the advanced has got it all in. Yeah, so you it's pretty it's... pricey. This sort of stuff you can do with an, with an EQ. Okay, so you're not going to get your 3D kind of visualisation, but there's nothing that you can use an Ableton EQ, you can slow it down, um, make it give you a kind of average, so so then you don't have to do your kind of spectrum. Analysis. That is just for the minute, it's just a quick reacting kind of EQ. Um, but yeah, your volume meters with your RMS levels are really powerful, and it's something really useful to have. Um, and I guess that's kind of just a whistle stop tour, but there's tons and tons of features in Ozone 5. Um, there's, there's loads and loads of presets, um, so if you're mastering kind of individual tracks, say not mastering, but if you're, you know, you want to use it to apply effects to, to um, single tracks within a mix, if your processor can handle it, you know, there's loads of presets for uh, drums, things like that, that you can kind of start off with, maybe have a play around with as well. So, very, very powerful tool, um, and excellent, excellent for mastery. So, yeah, that's uh, pretty much a wrap. Any, any questions? Um, the the, the multi-band um, stuff on each of the effects that you talked about, yeah. how you can separate the bands. Yeah, let's go back to that. Um, are they the same bands on each effect? If you change them, they will change on, so let's say we, we switched on dynamics here, haven't we? So, so let's, let's test that theory. I think, so if I put that to 140, and this is on the, the compressors and dynamics, um, but then I go over to um, stereo imaging, yeah, it's where I left it originally on 112. So they're separate, yes, it won't be the same for all of these, but as a general rule, you would want to keep it there and thereabouts without the effect. Yeah, because otherwise you're going to add some, possibly add something that you don't want to. Um, yeah. Any other? When you're mastering this kind of thing, do you have any, um, what are you thinking about end results? Like, I mean, where was this to be? Is this for you to play on a CD and play it, or is this to go online? And do you change your mastering based on, if something goes on SoundCloud, something's going to be played in the club? Yeah, 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 I suppose you would. Um, so I guess if you've got something that's going out and it's going to be in a club, you're going to want to, you're going to, want to make the bass hit quite hard. Um, you know, you're going to want to focus on uh, the rhythm of the track and things like that, because a lot of club tracks are quite punchy and you know, but, but then sometimes you kind of hear it on a sound system. There was a Dizzy Rascal track um, not too long ago, um, and it wasn't one of the dance track, but um, I, remember, I remember thinking, I heard it in a club, and there's loads of bass, I just remember it being really bass, it's bass line junkie, anyone, anyone heard that? Yeah, so, I'm a bass line junkie, and all that, <laughs> if you like Dizzy Rascal. Um, but I heard it on the radio in my car, and I haven't got a great set of speakers in my car, and I noticed that you couldn't hear, on my speakers, any, any of that lower content, so what it sounded like, it almost sounded like, a bit like that, because you could kind of hear all of the higher stuff, but there was no, no bass, and, um, and yeah, so, so yeah, definitely. I think you probably want to, you, you might want to master it differently depending on what medium it's going to be played on. But when you're mastering, I think one of the most important things is listen to it on lots of different devices. I, I don't know if you've ever, have you ever exported a track from Ableton, and it sounds amazing in Ableton. You get there, you export it, and you're like, 
and I'll put it in my car or something on my iPad and I'll be like, what? And you just notice loads of stuff that's just completely like different to, to how it sounded in Ableton. There's a few reasons for that. Um, I suppose you kind of, when you're mastering something, you can listen to it over and over and over again. So you've got to give yourself a bit of a break and come back to it as well. Because, you know, I've gone away from stuff and come back to it a week later and gone, oh, man, that shit, I'll, put this, I'll, I'll come back to this in a week and be like, oh, that's rubbish, isn't it? But, you know, um, so, so, yeah, definitely give yourself kind of a time gap before you're kind of going back to it. Because when you listen to something over and over again, you're kind of training yourself to think of it in that way. Um, lots of going the forums will say when you come up with a tune as well. If you change your notes, after you've listened to it loads, it's like, oh, that sounds completely out of place. But it might not to someone who's, you know, who's heard it for the first time. So kind of try and, you know, get it out there as much as possible as well and get your mates listening to it and stuff. Um, so yeah, different, different mm -hmm. techniques. Different techniques for different scenarios. Any others? Excellent. Okay. Well, thanks for your time. Um, if anyone wants to know more about um, mastering or any elements of the track and things like that, um, again, Add me through Facebook. Uh, I'll be on the. I'll, I'll post the uh, slides onto the uh, Ableton News Group uh, Facebook page. Um, you can catch my stuff on SoundCloud, um, and it's just uh, forward slash Stevie B. Um, and yeah, if you want to know more about the track, then just come ask me afterwards. I'll be around for however much longer we've got. Yeah. And uh, and uh, yeah, excellent. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.